Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Dean and Chapter, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this next in our series of Talkative Tuesday lectures around Dippy in the Cathedral. Last week's uh, talk was something of an exercise in paleogeography and biology, but this week we're being right, brought right up to date um, with a presentation from the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. It's a great pleasure to welcome Nick Atchison to speak to us on their behalf. And um, I'm sure that uh, although many of us will know Norfolk in many different ways, I'm, I'm sure that our knowledge and understanding of the county will be enhanced by what we're going to hear this evening. So thank you, Nick, for being with us. And we look forward to your words for us. Thank you all very much. I have a tendency to be quite loud. Am I too loud standing close to the mic? Is that all right? No, you can hear me. This is the first time I've ever spoken looking up the backside of a dinosaur, <laughs> which is um, enlightening to say the least. And you, of course, have the wonderful dinosaur's tail over your heads. And the dinosaur is, in a sense, the context, not just for us being here this evening, but also for the history of Norfolk, because, of course, a diplodocus is, some, is late Jurassic and is therefore from some 150 million years ago, something of that nature. And the story, really, of what we call Norfolk begins slightly later in the Cretaceous, about 70, 80, 90 million years ago. But we'll come on to that in just a moment. We're going to start in the woods of Norfolk. And there's a reason for starting in the woods of Norfolk, which is that post-Ice Age, which is what it's the end stop, realistically, for, for us and our understanding of landscape and the wildlife that we experience in our lives today. Really, that all begins with the retreat of the Devensian glaciation, which is a momentary flash in the pan compared to the history of a diplodocus. This is about 12,000 years ago, and following the retreat of the Devensian glaciation, which, of course, was the last of the glaciations of the Ice Age, the Ice Age having begun about 450,000 years years ago. From that point onwards, we were left with a tundra-like landscape which slowly would have been colonized by wildlife. And first we would have had uh, a tiger forest, like similar to the tiger forest that tragically are burning in Russia today in the east of Siberia and Yakutia. Um, then slowly it would have become a temperate forest over many, many centuries and thousands of years. And the reason I'm beginning with woodland is because the question you have to ask yourselves in relation to wildlife in Norfolk is why is this not a wood? And generally the answer is because humans have messed with it. So as we drive around our beautiful Norfolk, we see fields absolutely everywhere. And because we take fields as a baseline that we've known our whole lives, we shrug and go, oh yeah, fields. Every field in Norfolk wants to be woodland. And the only reason it isn't is because we stop it. And so woodland is the baseline for understanding the ecology of Norfolk. Nonetheless, there are patches of ancient woodland across Norfolk. There are many very important patches of ancient woodland. And an ancient wood is what we refer to when we talk about a wood that has existed for at least several hundred years. And we identify them by a number of species that are found in them. Generally, when someone talks about wildlife, we look at landscape in terms of plants. Plants tell you all sorts of things. They're exquisitely fussy. They're related to particular availability of water. They're related to particular types of soil. They're related to particular temperatures. So if you go to a place, the plants will tell you the nature of the place. And certain plants, there's an assemblage of them that we call ancient woodland indicators. They will tell you that a place has been woodland undisturbed for many hundreds of years. Now, I would love to spend hours and hours on every one of the habitats that's I'm talking to you about this evening, but I don't have that luxury. So I will show you one of the earliest flowering of the ancient woodland indicators in the springtime, which is wood anemone. And this one typically flowers just before the bluebells come into flower. So maybe two weeks, 10 days before the bluebells. And by the time you have the peak flush of bluebells, you've got the wood anemones going over. Another of our ancient woodland indicators is this. This is dog's mercury, so-called, because it would have been used as a poison in history. This is a very unusual plant in the Euphorbiaceae, the Euphorbia family, highly toxic, 
like many species. It's unusual in that it's dioecious, in that we have male plants and female plants, where most of our flowering plants have male and female sexual parts in the same flower. This is wild garlic, which is not a typical indicator of most of Norfolk, for example, in our Foxley wood, um, the, most, the largest patch of ancient woodland in Norfolk, which is between here and Fakenham in the Wensum Valley. We don't have large areas of wild garlic, but in the west of Norfolk, for example, the ancient woods around King's Lynn, there are large patches, and also down in the south of Norfolk. Absolutely delicious smell as you wander through its flowers, but the pinnacle ancient woodland indicator, of course, is the bluebell, associated particularly with woods on sandy soils. So if you visit our Foxley Wood, Norfolk Wildlife Trust Reserve, you'll see that the heavy clay part of the wood, which is indicative of the south of Norfolk, the clay lands, which is clay that was distributed during the Jurassic, which is the period when Dippy was alive, or the various bits of Dippy were alive, because of course he's a comp they are a composite, using the correct pronouns. Um, woodlands with bluebells are typically on sand, and the sandy part of Foxley Wood is absolutely humming with glorious bluebells. Something like 75% of the world's population of our species of bluebell are found here in the UK, and so our ancient woods are exquisitely important. But of course, ancient woods are not just about flowers. They're also about all of the diversity that lives in them. And as we well know, many hundreds of species are associated with uh, ancient woodland trees like oaks. Um, but many of our specialist butterflies are actually not so much associated with the trees, but also with the, the whole environment. And this is why we have to manage woods in a very specific and particular way, because humans have been part of the landscape that these woods occur in for as long as these woods have occurred in the Norfolk landscape. And throughout the history of our occupation of the landscape, we have used the woods for particular products. We didn't go to Boots to buy our medicines. Other chemists are available. And we didn't go to Sainsbury's to purchase our food and our clothes and so on. We went to the woods because that's where resources were available to us for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so the nature that lives in our woods is there because of the interaction of hundreds of years of human occupation of the landscape. And our woods were managed for timber, which is the big, solid, what we call wood, which we use for building ships and building furniture and building houses, but also for wood, which is a separate product. And wood is the light, whippy stuff that can be used for burning, for making into charcoal, for making stakes, for making faggots, for binding the banks of rivers, for the faggots that the cathedral is built on. This building has no foundations, just so you know. It's built on piles of willow whips, and they, of course, are wood as opposed to timber. And all of these products meant that the woods took on a particular identity with lots of light and shade, because if you harvest, you bring light in. And when you get light, you get flowers, and you get butterflies. And this butterfly needs dog violets, it needs the early dog violet and the common dog violet because those are the plants that its caterpillars feed on. And so without that light and shade that's been generated by our historic management of woods for centuries, you don't have these butterflies. This is the silver washed fritillary, which is a good news story because it disappeared from Norfolk in the middle of the 20th century, but in the last 20 years has flooded back and is now positively common in woodland at this time of year. If you want to see one on the next beautiful sunny day, go to Foxley Wood and you will see them there. But of course woodland is associated with many birds as well. Many of our common garden birds are in fact woodland species because woodlands that are managed for products have light and shade, they have open patches and they have scrubby patches and we have created that habitat right across the county in our gardens which are a mixture of light and shade. So the chaffinches, the great tits, the blue tits, the great spotted woodpeckers, the blackbirds and the song thrush that we see in our gardens, they are all woodland glade birds, woodland edge birds, typically associated with that habitat. Less so this one, although of course in February when we 
had the brutally cold snap. People everywhere in Norfolk were saying, oh my goodness me, there's a woodcock under my bird's table. They were driven out of the woods, which are their home, where they want to be by the fact that there wasn't food available to them because they can only feed by probing the ground. They have a, a sensitive and slightly flexible tip to the bill with which they feel around in the ground for worms and other invertebrates. Now, having looked at woodland, because woodland is the baseline for our land habitats, we're going to move to the coast. And the coast is another of our highly natural environments. And there are many natural environments. When I say highly natural, it's because everything else in the county is the product of us doing stuff. And this is much less so in the case of our coastal environments. And the first one I'm going to look at is salt marsh. Every habitat on the coast is a function of two conditions. One is energy and the other is substrate. And you need the right amount of energy to deliver the substrate and allow it to settle. And in the case of salt marsh, you need extremely low energy. We have vast amounts of silt that come out of the east coast of the UK. They come out of the Humber in the case of Norfolk. They come down the east coast and they're distributed by wave action across the coast. Now, wave action means that silt, which is tiny, tiny particles, is very unlikely to settle. And we have tides twice a day because of the movement of the moon. We have tides coming up to the shore. And so you only end up with still enough salt water in places where the tide is interrupted and the wave action is interrupted. So salt marshes settle behind spits, such in the case of Norfolk as Blakeney Point, Skolt Head Island, or at the top of very long beaches. Now, if any of you have been going to the Holcomb National Nature Reserve for the last 30, 40 years, you will remember a time when there was a long, sandy beach and no salt marsh. Now, when you walk out through Holcomb Gap, there is a wonderful salt marsh, actually a very important salt marsh. All four of our, um, our flowering species of um, sea lavender can be found there right now if you go at the weekend, you can see them all there. It's a very, very special place, but it has formed over the last decades as the sand dunes have slowed down the progress of the tide and as the beach has got longer and longer. And so the silt, which is carried by the waves, begins to settle only in the point behind a spit or a bar where you have the turn of the tide, when you've got theoretically no energy pushing the tied up and theoretically no energy taking it away and at that point these tiny particles of silt are able to settle and what they do is called flocculation they stick to each one another much in the way of a tube of polos they're little flat clay particles they stick to each other and then they become heavier and more likely to settle and then of course they're colonized by algae the first species usually is a species called valkyria and then after that glass worts that in Norfolk we call sampha of course, and then all of the other species of the salt marsh can move in. And there is what's called a succession of species. Each species needing slightly higher silt and therefore slightly less inundation to the tide until you end up right at the top of the salt marsh with shrubby sea blight and sea beet and species which don't like to be exposed to much seawater. Now, the plants are very important, but they provide habitat for wonderfully important populations of other species. Salt marshes are phenomenally productive habitats. And if you've been to the coast in winter, shame on if you haven't, you will have heard the wonderful calls of this bird. This is the dark-bellied Brent goose. Dark-bellied Brent geese breed in Siberia, Western Siberia. In particular, the ones that come to us come from the Taimir Peninsula. They're small, just bigger than a mallard, really. Very conversational. You know they come from Russia because they have this deep, Slavic, purring sound that they make. They say, raw, 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 raw. this wonderful rolling call. And the dark-bellied Brent goose is a very common winter to the North... Uh, winter visitor to the Norfolk coast, where it's accompanied by birds such as widgeon, which are also common in the salt marshes, curlews. And in springtime, it's the breeding habitat for our red shanks. Red shanks breed in a number of habitats through the county, but really, if you go in April, May to the salt marshes, you will hear the lovely rocking song of the red shank. And this one's a summer plumage bird standing on a post, which is exactly where you would expect 
to see them. In wintertime, the edges of the salt marsh are feeding habitat for a number of birds, snow buntings, lapland buntings to a smaller extent, and also this exquisite bird, the shore lark, also known as the horned lark, which is a rare visitor to us. And it can also be found on shingle. Now, shingle needs opposite conditions, really. Shingle is a much, much heavier thing to move, and so you need violent action of the waves in order to throw it up onto the beach, especially in the case of the cobblestones of a beach like Sheringham. You need a lot of energy to hurl the stones onto the shore. And shingle is a relatively rare habitat. Suffolk has wonderful long stretches of shingle and probably the most important coastal vegetated shingle in the country. But here in Norfolk, we also have significant areas at Norfolk Wildlife Trust climb marshes and stretching all the way to our salt house marshes, marshes reserve. At the RSPB's reserve in Snettisham, there are areas of coastal vegetated shingle. And this is a very rare habitat nationally with a host of specialist things that live in it. In particular, down in uh, Dungeness, for example, in the southeast of the country, lots of rare invertebrates. But we have a number of special species that are, in that are associated with it here in Norfolk. This is one of the baseline plants, one of the plants you would expect to see. This is biting stone crop. And if you go in this time of year, maybe slightly earlier in the summer to our client salthouse marshes, you will see the sea bank uh, covered in the yellow flowers of this plant and the white flowers of this one. This is sea campion, which is another classic plant of this environment, but really the species that we most associate with this habitat is the glorious yellow horned poppy. And although this weather won't be doing it any good, it will carry on flowering now for another month. So if you've never seen this glorious plant, now's a great time to go see it. And of course, the seeds of these species and the curled docks that grow among them are the winter food for this glorious creature, the snow bunting. Very scarce as a breeding species in the UK. It breeds only in the Cairngorms, but nonetheless quite a common winter visitor and Norfolk is really where it's at for these species. Now sand dunes are formed in a different way altogether. They're formed by the interaction of the wind and the sand and you need a number of conditions. You need onshore winds, you need a long sandy beach and at the top of the beach which has had the sand blown up it by the action of the wind you need a nucleus you need something it could be the corpse of a dead baby seal it could be a branch it could be goodness knows what you need something to break the energy of the wind and behind it the sand begins to be dropped. You've all seen this on the beach, where little stones stick up from the beach on a windy day, and in the lee of the wind, you've seen those long stretches of sand which accumulate. That's exactly how sand dunes begin to form, but they need to be above the highest tides because if they're below the highest tides, they then become destroyed. So in exactly the same way as the uh, salt marshes are colonized gradually by um, plants. We have the same effect in the sand dunes. First, they're colonized by plants like prickly saltwort and um, sea rocket, and then by a grass called sea sand cooch grass. And then, of course, in comes marum grass. This is another of the pioneer species. This is sea sandwort, which is in the Caryophyllaceae, the carnation family, and it's one of the very pioneer species after which we begin to get the grasses. And if we go back to this one, you can see these are yellow dunes which are being built by marum, and marum is a superhero grass. It's able to grow up through 10, 20, 30 meters of sand dune as more and more sand is deposited on it. And what it does is introduce physical structure to the dune, but it also introduces nutrients because, of course, it is sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and carbon stabilizes the soil. It adds the ability to retain water. It brings in other species. And so this is the builder of the dunes after which you end up with other species colonizing. But in the fore dune, the very early part of the dune, which would be uh, colonized by species like the sea sandwort, you have some very rare and special birds breeding. This is little tern. Little terns, there are only a handful of thousands of pairs of little terns which breed in the country every year, and about a quarter of them very often, about a thousand birds, pairs, will nest in Norfolk between the the coast of the broad, so the Yarmouth area, Horsey, Winterton, and also along the northwest Norfolk coast between Holme and um, uh, Holcombe Reserve, 
this is nesting area for little terns, and they nest in that very vulnerable area along the front edge of the dunes where the dappled stones and plants disguise their nests and they nest among other species like ringed plover which is a very another very vulnerable species to human disturbance along the beaches. Then we get over the marram into the older dunes which are referred to as the grey dunes and the grey dunes are really the explosively biodiverse habitat where many of the rarest things live. This is a dog violet. It's not the dog violet that the um, silver wash fertility would need to feed on. This is the heath dog violet, which is the food plant of the dark green fritillary, which is this species, which is really a high summer species. It is out for about the month before the silver wash fritillary, and it's very associated with our dune systems. You can see it at home dunes, you can see it at Winterton and Horsey, you can see it at Holcomb dunes, an absolutely fabulous thing. And you can see this as well. This is the grayling. This is another species that's declined enormously across the Norfolk landscape with the introduction of modern agricultural techniques. This is a butterfly of old, unmanaged heathland habitats of sandy places with low nutrient grassland. Now, until the enclosures of the 1700s and the subsequent invention of nitrate fertilizers, mechanized agricultural machinery, we had vast areas of old village commons of heaths on sandy soils, absolutely vast areas. And these would have been full of such species as small coppers and wall browns and um, grayling butterflies, which have now dwindled effectively to managed nature reserves because the landscape that they lived in, we have obliterated across Norfolk. The older dunes are also the habitat of a very important species nationally. We have two hugely important colonies at Holcombe and on our Norfolk Wildlife Trust Reserve at home. This is the Natterjack toad. The natterjack is a much smaller species than the common toad that you'll see in your gardens, and it is enormously fussier. Natterjacks need ephemeral pools. They can't cope with any competition from fish, from common frogs, from common toads. They need shallow ponds with short vegetation around the edges, which makes them very fussy and very difficult to manage for. But happily, they've had a very successful breeding season this year at Holcombe and at home. The populations in the broads, the Winterton Horsey um, colonies, they've gone down very significantly in recent years, partly as a result of coastal management with saltwater incursion under the dunes, but I'm happy to say that they still have plenty of good habitat on Norfolk Wildlife Trust home dunes and the, uh, the Holcombe National Nature Reserve. Now, wherever you go, this time of year, we're reaching the end of the nesting period of our wonderful colonies of gulls and terns. The main colonies are on Sculthead Island and on Blakeney Point, and over the history of these colonies, they flipped between the two. Some years, the bulk of the birds, maybe up to 4,000 pairs of sandwich tern, will be on Blakeney Point. At the moment, the, the bulk of the birds tend to be on Sculthead Island, but in a few years' time, they'll flip back to the National Trust Blakeney Point Reserve. And they've been joined in recent years, not just by the terns. We think of the terns as being a common thing in our history, but in fact, sandwich tern only nested in Norfolk for the first time in the 19, late 20s, early 30s. And then they did very well for themselves during the Second World War. They moved into a minefield on Cly Beach, and they nested very successfully on Cly Beach for a few years. Then they moved on to Blakeney Point. Um, and then from there, they moved to Skolt. But this is another new colonist. This is the Mediterranean gull. When I was a child, this was a, a mythical being in Norfolk. And I now see them all the time. And that's probably as a result of climate change, which is a theme that I'll be referring uh, referring to several times. Of course, another recent colonist is this one, the grey seal. And we're not really quite sure why they have marched down the east coast of the country. But in the space of 15 years, we've gone from grey seals not breeding in Norfolk to having uh, many thousands of pups every year. So about four and a half thousand pups are born on Blakeney Point every year and something like two, three thousand pups are now being born at Winterton Horsey as well. So the population of grey seals has gone up exponentially. At the same time, the harbour seal, also known as the common seal, has actually become a much scarcer species over the last few decades. And another species whose credit is very, very high at the moment is the spoonbill. I'm not at liberty to mention 
mention the number of nests that there were at Holcomb this year, but it was stratospheric, quite incredible for a bird that nested with us for the first time 11 years ago. And we're now talking dozens of pairs of birds in the magnificent colony of spoonbills and little egrets. And well, last year there were cattle egrets, but the cold spell killed them off. And this year there were also half a dozen pairs of great egrets nesting in the colony as well. Now we're going to spin to the broads, having looked at the coast. The broads, of course, are the most important lowland wetland in England, and they are, again, the result of natural factors and human management of the landscape. We have this remarkably wet area of Norfolk, which is the confluence of the Wensum, which is the river that we're on here, the river that my house is on in North Norfolk, which is joined by the Yare, and although the Yare is the smaller river, east of Nor Norwich, it takes the name. As someone who was born on the Wensum and who lives on the Wensum, I think the big town down by Braden is actually called Great Wensumouth because the Yare is a piddly little river coming out of the south of Norfolk and has no business taking the name. But no nonetheless, we have the Wensum, the Yare, the Waveney down in the south, and then coming out of the north, off the backside of the Holtcromer Ridge, we have the Bure, the Fern, we have, um, he says, looking at the map, the Ant, which comes up between the middle of the two. And those are the main rivers, and all of them end up flowing out to sea through Braden Water. Now, this landscape, having been very wet for a very, very long time, has generated peat. And as we all know, in the Middle Ages, peat was phenomenally valuable for heating your home, for cooking. It was very, very valuable as a burning material before the advent of fossil fuels in our lives. And so the peat diggings of the broads are what became the lakes themselves, the broads. And together, these have formed phenomenally important habitats for wildlife. One of the most critical habitats is what we refer to as a fen. And a fen is an alkaline marsh, which is rich in a diversity of plants. And one of the characteristic plants, of, very common, is this one, a spring flowering plant called ragged robin, one of the very rarest with our own special form of this plant between Norfolk and Suffolk is this tiny little thing. And when I say tiny, I mean really tiny like this. This is Liparis lurzoli, the fen orchid. It occurs at about a dozen sites in the country. One of them, which is a slightly different form, is in the south of Wales, and the rest of them are all in the Norfolk Broads and just in the north of Suffolk. An exquisite tiny wee thing, but sadly most of the sites are kept very, very secret. Alongside it, of course, there are much commoner species like southern marsh orchid. Another of the peak experience species of the Norfolk Broads is the swallowtail. The swallowtail is not just beautiful, it's not just rare, it's not just our symbol of our Norfolk uh, Broads, it's not just the largest butterfly in the country, it is also an endemic subspecies. This subspecies, Papilio macaon britannicus, is not found anywhere else in the world. And so anything that happens to the Norfolk Broads will happen to this exquisite species. There's its egg. Each female lays only one egg on a plant of milk parsley. And if in early summer you see swallowtails flying low over the reed beds, they are looking for milk parsley plants, but they're not just looking for milk parsley plants, they're looking for eggs on milk parsley plants because the caterpillars are cannibalistic. And if there is an egg already on a milk parsley plant, it will chomp its way through the caterpillar whose egg you have just laid. So it's not a good idea to lay your egg on a plant that's already got an egg on it. Another character charismatic species of the fens of the Norfolk Broads is the grass snake. And this one, although they're introduced and I'm supposed to hate them, I absolutely love them. This is the beautiful Chinese water deer, which has experienced a sort of ecological release in my lifetime. When I was a child, you had to go to the broads, you had to look for them, and now I can see them on my bike from home. They've spread out into Norfolk farmland, and although they're always shy, they're difficult to see, they're now a common species over much of Norfolk. Now, reed bed is a very simple fen, which is dominated by one species, common reed, Phragmites australis, and it has a number of very special species associated with it. One, of course, is the bittern. I remember a time in the late 1980s when there were fewer than 10 booming males in the whole country. And there are now well in excess of 100 booming males in the country. And we are delighted to have them back. And that's because we know how to manage young wet reed beds with lots of deep channels 
for the bittern. So that's a species that's doing well through conservation management. Here's another species that's returned in my lifetime. This, of course, is a female marsh harrier. This is a male marsh harrier. And there's a simple reason they've returned. We stopped killing them. In the Victorian period, anything with a hooked beak and claws was evil and was to be punished. And we got rid of them. They were so common in the early Victorian period, they were referred to in Victorian bird books as the Norfolk hawk. And then we killed them all off. And from the 1970s, they recolonized. When I was a child, they were a thing you mentioned in hushed whispers every time you saw them. And now I can watch them from my bathtub. Um, watching marsh harriers from my bathtub is optional, but we can discuss rates if anyone's <laughs> interested. Um, this is a bearded tit. Bearded tit is another species associated, of course, with the reed beds. It likes an older reed bed, so they do well where you've got a, six, a rotation in cutting of the reeds. Young reed for the bitterns, slightly older reed for the marsh harriers, and the bearded tits. And this really is my favorite of all the species associated with our fens and our wet grasslands and our reed beds. This is the crane. Again, when I was a child, we used to go to the broads and there were maybe 10 individual cranes in the broads. The first pair appeared at a hickling first, although later that winter they moved to Horsey in 1979. They first attempted to breed in 1981. They first bred successfully in 1982. And then since then, gradually, the population of cranes has been going up and up and up. And we now have at least a dozen pairs nesting in the broads, but they've also spread to the fens in the west of the county and beyond. And there are now, there's a winter roost commonly of 70 birds between the Neen washes, the Ouse washes, and Welney in the west of the county and just over the border. They've spread north into Link Lincolnshire and Yorkshire. They are a phenomenal success story. And another bird that we killed off in the medieval period through eating them and through draining their habitats and converting them into other things. And then we have the open water of the broads themselves, which are phenomenally important for wintering waterfowl, huge numbers of teal, of widgeon, and various other ducks visit us. For breeding great crested grebes, another bird that we killed off in the Victorian period. Can you imagine ladies wearing an entire grebe on their heads as a hat? And it was over issues like that that a group of ladies in Manchester, uh, the equivalent of a WI, got together and formed an organization that's now called the RSPB, one of the most powerful conservation organizations in the world. And uh, a book's just come out by Tessa uh, Bowes um, about one of the founders of the RSPB and her advocacy for birds. Long before men were acting on it, women were taking action to protect our birds. And the broads are breeding habitat also for the common term. That's a species that's moved inland during my lifetime and with the increasing um, provision of nesting platforms in the broads, as for example at our Barton Broad and our Ramworth Broad reserves, you can watch these birds fishing. And the broads is fantastically important for the beautiful water vole, a species that's declined with the loss of wet habitats, wet grazing marshes, the loss of ditches and dikes, and the loss of water quality across the county. But here's one that's doing better. The otter suffered. Of course, it was always hunted historically, but the reason they disappeared was the use of dieldrin, DDT, and so on in the 1960s, which was also what did for the peregrines who are roosting right above our heads at the moment as I speak. Um, the water quality did for the otter, but with stricter laws being brought in to, um, to protect water quality through the limitation of the use of these pesticides, otters have returned. Of course, there were also reintroduction projects, and the otter is now positively a common species. There's probably an otter within a mile of us right now because they swim right through the center of Norwich, and they're not an uncommon sight even here in the city. We're now going to go to the west of the county and to the fens. If you're a drop of water, you've got three choices to get out of Norfolk. Of course, you're very likely to go down into the chalk, which is the late Cretaceous bedrock of Norfolk, and then you're going to come up as a spring, so it's going to take you a while, but you've got three choices. You either go off one of the little chalk streams in the north of Norfolk, so the Stithkey, the Glaven, the Han, etc. Those are tiny, short rivers, and they're very, very precious and very, very important, and they have a lot of really special biodiversity associated with them. 
but the bulk of the water is less imaginative than that, and it either goes into one of the Broads rivers and goes out through Braden Water, or it goes into one of the Fens rivers and goes out through Kings Lynn through the river Great Ouse. And Kings Lynn is phenomenally important. All of the water of 13 counties of the Midlands goes out through Kings Lynn, which means that all of the eels of 13 counties of England come back from the Sargasso Sea through the port of Kings Lynn. Absolutely mind-blowing that we have this great migratory, migratory species swimming up through the river Ouse in such numbers. But we're going to look at a number of other habitats associated with the fens. And I'm starting here with two species, one of which is doing very well and the other of which is dropping off the face of the planet as far as the fens are concerned. On the left, you've got a relatively small swan with a rounded blob of yellow in the base of the bill and a rather kind looking face and this is Buick Swan named after Thomas Buick of the woodcuts the famous illustrator of the 18th century in the middle much more angular and haughty you have the Icelandic species the Hooper Swan now Hoopers are visiting us in ever increasing numbers the world population of Hooper Swans which are our ones are nesting in in Iceland is going up and up and up this is a species that's doing well the Buick Swan is both declining into Nationally. It's a Russian breeding species, but it is also no longer coming to visit us. And this is climate change. We have a species of goose in the broads called the tiger bean goose. When I was a young man, um, there would be 300 tiger bean geese in the broads. For the last two years, one family of tiger bean geese has come to the Yare Valley, to Buckingham Marshes, about five, six birds each year. And when that one family forgets that migration, that last step in the migration, we will never have tiger bean geese again and the reason they don't come is because the continental winters are warmer and warmer and warmer and they just don't need to bother anymore and that's why Buick swans are plummeting from our British landscapes we just don't get them anymore but hooper swans are on the up uh, Buick swans are on the down. I don't know why I've included that map, so we'll politely skip over it. This is a talk that I prepared a long, long time ago, and I confess I haven't had time to think about it, so I'm making all this up as I go along. So we're going to skip off over the map and move on to something else. Ah, oh, yes, here's what I was talking about. I was talking about the fens in the west of Norfolk, and of course, the sound of Fenland in the winter, the sound of northwest Norfolk is the pink footed goose. This is another bird that's doing phenomenally well for itself. When Peter Scott went to Iceland to find the nesting grounds of the, of the pink-footed goose in 1951. There were estimated to be about 30,000 birds. Today, there are 530,000 pink-footed geese. And Norfolk agriculture will have had a big role in that because, of course, over the same period, we have farmed sugar beet. And sugar beet has traditionally been harvested by cutting off the tops in the field, leaving the tops in the field. And it's, it's like a Mars bar for a pink-footed goose. And if you amplify that across the Norfolk landscape, then you end up with, with a, a sweet shop right through the middle of the winter for pink-footed geese. Now, for various reasons, including changes in farming and um, climate change, nowhere near so many pink-footed geese come to Norfolk now as they were doing a few years ago. And it's very probable that within the next 10 or 20 years, pink-footed geese will start wintering in Iceland and not so much coming down to Scotland and Lancashire and further down to Norfolk. But nonetheless, for the moment, we have phenomenal flocks of pink-footed geese with the highest flocks ever recorded above 100,000 birds in Norfolk in the depths of winter. Widgeon are also a common visitor. They come from the opposite direction. They come from Russia largely, but also Fenescandia. Absolutely exquisite birds with that gorgeous piping whistle from the male that you hear in wintertime. And lapwings. Now, very sadly, lapwing in the lives of some people here would have been a common breeding farmland bird. But one does, I'm from farming families. I have nothing against farmers. My godfathers are both farmers. My grandparents were all born on farms. I have nothing against farmers whatsoever. But it would be disingenuous of us to pretend that we haven't radically changed the way we farm over the course of the 20th century. We've ripped out the hedges. We no longer leave winter stubbles. We have massive mechanized agriculture. We use vastly more um, agricultural fertilizers and pesticides. The nature of farmland is not the same. And that is the reason, or one of the reasons, that lapwings have disappeared from the landscape. Lapwings would have been 
a hundred times commoner in the landscape of our grandparents than they are today as a breeding bird, but happily they still visit us in large numbers in winter. This is an interesting bird. This is the black-tailed godwit. We have two pairs of, two uh, forms of black-tailed godwit in the county. Again, we have birds from Iceland, and they tend to hang around with us throughout the year as young birds before they go up to Iceland to breed, or indeed as older birds after they've bred and they no longer want to bother. But then we have our own subspecies, which is largely continental, so they're common breeders, for example, in the Netherlands and going further east into Europe, and we have just a handful of pairs of them that nest in Fenland. So, for example, the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust at Welney is engaged in a project called Head Starting, where, because predation is a big problem for these birds, they take the eggs into captivity, they raise them in captivity until they're old enough to fend for themselves, they put special leg flags on their legs so we know who they are, and then they release them back into the wild. And this is proving successful. The birds that have been Head Starting are already breeding in the wild. And then, of course, the main attraction for waders in the wash area is the wash itself in the Fen area, I'm sorry, is the wash itself, which is the, the estuary of four major rivers, the Welland, the Witham, the Neen, and the Ouse, coming out of Norfolk, of course, the Ouse. And this is a biological powerhouse. It's one of the most important mudflats in Britain. It produces vast, vast, vast amounts of food in the form of shellfish and worms for migratory wintering birds. There was a count of, I was there last year at Snettisham, the RSPB reserve, of 120,000 knots pushed off the wash on a single day. And those birds are all there. Our wash, our wash wintering um, knot are largely Greenland and Canadian birds. But at the same time, we also have Siberian birds that pass through in the autumn time. So you can have not from Siberia and not from Canada and Greenland wintering on the wash alongside vast numbers of curlews and oyster catchers and grey plovers um, and a whole host of other wetland birds. It really is a phenomenal sight. And here we have not again, the odd black-tailed godwit and black-headed gull in there as well. And the wash is surprisingly important for the harbour seal or common seal. There's a big pupping ground of common seals out on the wash here with the very gentle face. Grey seals have a big powerful snout and this rather haughty look about them. If a seal looks at you as if it's going to take you down, it's a grey seal. If it looks, as you, it looks at you with this meek, loving face, then it's a common seal or a harbour seal. They also have V-shaped nostrils, which they flare. They go really sort of open at the top, giving them this sweet look. Now, we're going to move to another habitat now. On sand, you get heaths. And the heath is, again, a product of human use of the landscape, as are indeed the fens that I talked about before, the grass and the wet grazing, grass, uh, grazing marshes of Fenland. Heaths happen where you have usually ice age rubble dumps, so where the ice sheets have left sand and you end up with very, very poor soils lying over the top of the chalk. Um, so, for example, on the holt Cromer Ridge, at the top of the Bure, on the green sands, the sand is, uh, itself is very ancient, but it was distributed there by the glaciations in the west of Norfolk. And following on from the Bronze Age, which is when humans really began to mess things up and chop down the forest, you ended up with these areas where nothing could grow but this almost Mediterranean, garrigue-like vegetation, which we refer to as heathland. And it's dominated by a number of species, particularly by heathers. This is common heather, but in Norfolk we also have cross-leaved heath, and we have bell heather, and also by gorses. And in Norfolk, although there are old records of dwarf gorse, we effectively have two species, common gorse and western gorse. And heaths have traditionally been managed by grazing tough breeds of livestock. Not because anyone wanted them to remain as heaths, but because the thing that you could do as someone in the Middle Ages, right up to the early 20th century, as a poor person with commoners' rights, you owned 
two sheep and one cow and one horse or one donkey, and you had the commoner's rights to graze it on the heath. Now, this is very bleak and brutal grazing. This is a rubbish place for being a goat or a sheep or a cow or a horse. It's a difficult place to make a living, but it's the only place you've got the right to put that animal, which is fundamentally important to your livelihood. So for centuries, they've been grazed in that way. People would also have had the right to gather particular natural resources off the heath. So they would have gathered gorse, and gorse could be used in a number of different ways. Gorse burns very hot, so it was used in baker's ovens. But it's also, being a member of the legume family, the pea family, it's rich in nitrogen, and nitrogen is what makes proteins. But it's inedible because it's so spiky, so it would have been ground to make a meal which you could have fed to your livestock during the winter time when you've got them folded close to your homestead. So what's the best way to manage a heath? The best way to manage a heath is the way that a heath has been managed for centuries, which is rough old, with rough old breeds of livestock. So what we do at Norfolk Wildlife Trust, what our colleagues in conservation tend to do as well, is graze animals like, in our case, Dartmoor ponies. But on some of our heaths, we've also got British white cattle. On some heaths in the north of Norfolk, there are baggot goats. Those are the smellier of the heaths because they're all billy goats that have been, they're not wanted for breeding. And so they're, they're pungent as grazing animals go. You can smell them. Don't stand downwind of the grazing animals. But the heaths in the north of Norfolk, the ones in the upper end of the Bure Valley, the ones on the Hulk Cromer Ridge, they have this wonderful mixed sward with the summer flowering. Now's the time to go and see it. The summer flowering western gorse, which is the short, really, really shocking yellow one. Not the one that's a taller bush that smells of coconut in April when the first sunshine hits it, but a much squatter very, very, a darker green, very, very spiky bush. And then in amongst it, you've got the gorgeous magenta bell heather, which is also characteristic of those North Norfolk heaths. And heaths are habitat for a number of wonderful species, among them the stone chat here, a beautiful juvenile. And where you see stone chats, you have a chance of seeing these. This is another climate colonist. This is the Dartford warbler. It's a bird that didn't breed in Norfolk in my childhood, but has moved into the county. And although our population is small, the population in Suffolk is doing very well, and so we're always boosted by birds that move up here from there. It's, of course, also the habitat of the nightjar, an extraordinary bird. In, uh, across the world, there are many species in the family of the nightjars, the Caprimulgidae, but here in Britain, we only have the one. They've always been associated with with evil and uh, dark omens. If you think about a life before electric light, a life before modern ag education, a life in which life was hard and short and difficult, and you didn't understand, you didn't have a scientific education, if things went wrong, it was easy to point a finger of blame at the natural world. And things that made weird noises in bleak, wild landscapes like Heath at night would have been the sort of thing you blamed. Um, they would have been the immigrants of the Middle Ages. And the night jars were easy to blame because they made these dark, trilling sounds in the middle of the night. And they, even up to Roman times, they were known as caprimulgus, which means the goat milker. And if your goat went dry, if your goat stopped giving you milk, then you would blame the night jar because the night jar, no bird in the world drinks milk. It's very, very bad for them indeed. But the night jar clearly came and sucked dry the teats of your goat, leaving her barren. Um, the night jar doesn't do that. Um, but happily, right across our heaths and indeed down in the breaks, we have them. But many um, wonderful invertebrates are also associated with our heaths. This is the gorgeous green tiger beetle, which is an easy species to see in the springtime. This is another spring beetle. This is one of our dung beetles. This is the minotaur beetle, which is a specialist in rabbit dung. Did you know, while I'm on heaths, did you know we have a fungus at Norfolk Wildlife Trust um, uh, home dunes. We have two very special um, fungi at Norfolk Wildlife Trust home dunes. One of them, the relatively common one, was new for Norfolk a few years ago. It's called Peronia, and it's found only on the dung of our ponies. But since then, a new species for Britain has been found on the poo of our bunnies. 
in the dunes at, um, and that's called, now I can't remember the English name actually, I'm a uh, shame on me, but we have a fungus at Norfolk Wildlife Trust Home Dunes that's only found on bunny poo, and it's the only place in the country that can, you can find it. Now, if that isn't a reason to visit Norfolk Wildlife Trust Home Dunes, I don't know what is. Um, other invertebrates particularly associated with our heath, of course, include butterflies. This one's the green hair streak. This is the time of year for purple hair streaks, for um, uh, white letter hair streaks, the high summer butterflies, but the green hair streak is a springtime butterfly. That day, when you smell the sunshine on the gorse flowers and you get that extraordinary stench of coconut, that is the day to look for the green hair streak. Look for them among blackthorn blooms, look for them among European gorse blooms, and if you look carefully, you will see this exquisite bright green butterfly. Much more of a summer butterfly is this one. This is the silver studded blue butterfly, an absolutely exquisite thing, and it can only survive in very, very short grazed heaths, the sort of heaths that are very, very sunburned. So traditionally, they would have had sheep on them that grazed them very, very short. These days, we do it with mechanized uh, machinery because it's much, much easier. And the reason they can only survive in the shortest, most sunburned heaths is because they need to be taken down into the burrows of an ant in order to survive. The caterpillars can't survive unless the ants take them down into their burrows, and the ants can only cope where the sun heats the, the temperature of the soil particularly high, which can only happen where the heathland is really, really short. Talk about fussy. Talk about the sorts of things we have to micromanage for these species to exist. But happily, um, a population of the silver studded blue has been reintroduced in North Norfolk on Kelling Heath, where they are thriving. Adders also associated with our heaths. The adder would have been a common species she's right across Norfolk in the lives of our great grandparents but because of the massive scale loss of commons of old grazing land of old marshes of old heaths and so on we have lost adders on a massive scale also um, the adder of course is best separated from the grass snake by the shape of its pupil both of them can the grass snakes and adders can both be black so you wouldn't be able to tell by the color of the skin but the adder's pupils are slit shaped like a cat and the grass snake has a round pupil. I advise against going too close and staring into the eyes of the adders because you might have a moment that's too late. Now, because we have sandy soils on our heaths where they are wet, you have very, very low nutrient availability. And what happens if you've got acidic water with no nutrients available to uh, plants is that they start becoming carnivorous. And we have a number of carnivorous species of plants in Norfolk. This is the commonest of all. This is Drosera rotundifolia, the um, round-leaved sundew. It's a very tiny plant that grows in what are known as bogs. We don't really have bogs in Norfolk, very, very few of them, because we don't have acid water, because we have chalk underlying the whole of Norfolk, so all of our water comes up from the chalk bedrock, meaning we have alkaline water. But in a few places, such as Dursingham Bog, Royden Common, Grimston Warren, one or two parts of the catchment of the Thurn River, you've got sphagnum moss that sits on peaty soils and turns the surface water acidic. And that's where you get these very, very low nutrient assemblages of plants, including these ones that catch insects to eat. It's also the place where you get very rare dragonflies like the keeled skimmer and this beautiful little thing. Now's the time to go look for this at Royden Common, Grimston Warren, Dursing and Bog. This is the black darter, which is an acid-loving species, and that's why we don't have it across most of Norfolk. And this thing, this is common in much of upland Britain. This is the raft spider. We have two species of raft spider in Norfolk. We have the raft spider and the fen raft spider. Nationally, the fen raft spider is much, much rarer, but actually we've now had it reintroduced in the south of Norfolk in the broads. But this is the raft spider. The only place it can be found in East Anglia is at Royden Common in the acidic wetlands where it's particularly associated with a scarce plant called bog myrtle, which again, if you've never experienced the smell of bog myrtle, tomorrow you must go to a bog and you must wade around picking leaves off plants until you smell bog myrtle and your lives will never be the same. 
again. Now, the final habitat that I want to talk to you about is the Brex. It's not one habitat, it's a whole landscape, and it's the landscape that lies probably closest to my heart. The Brex is exceptional in every single way. You can't talk about Brexton wildlife and landscape without straying into hyperbole. The Brex is the result of the chalk lying very close to the surface. So the chalk was made in the late Cretaceous. About 70, 80, 90 million years ago, we were under the sea. And it was a shallow subtropical sea, which was heaving with plankton, and in particular a plankton called a coccolithophore. I promise I'm not making this up. And the coccolithophores had on them these tiny plates of calcium, and the tiny plates of calcium are theorized to have focused the light of the sun, the better to photosynthesize. And over the 30, 40 million years that this shallow tropical sea covered us, Billions and billions and billions of these coccoliths, the tiny plates of calcium, bled down to the bottom of the sea and formed the chalk. Now, this is the chalk that is the White Cliffs of Dover. It's the chalk that's the South Downs, the North Downs, the North Norfolk Cromashoal Reef, where the endemic purple sponge lives that's newly been named. Well, I was on the committee that chose the name. That's called the Purple Dumplum. Um, which is a good Norfolk name for a Norfolk sponge. Um, the chalk was formed in the late Cretaceous. There's even another link in the story that some scientists, having looked at the chalk through powerful microscopes, have seen that all of the coccoliths that were born in the bodies of the plankton, the coccolithophores, it's scrunched up, and they suspect that small shrimp-like animals, uh, decapods called uh, copepods, that they probably ate the planktons, and that the White Cliffs of Dover and the chalk underlying the whole of Norfolk is probably ancient late Cretaceous fossil shrimp poo rather than just the coccoliths having fallen off the plankton. But that is, again, theoretical. But in the Brex, the chalk lies very close to the surface, and over the top you have a fine layer of sand. You also have a unique climate in the Brex. You have, amazingly, some of the coldest nights of lowland England. Frost has been recorded in the Brex in every month of the year. Right into midsummer, you can get frosts in the Brex. The Brex also have, traditionally, the climate's changing now, a continental climate, meaning they get very hot summers. We are, of course, the hottest, driest part of the country. You wouldn't know it today, but traditionally, historically, we've been the hottest, driest part of the country. So you end up with essentially a continental climate, hot summers, cold winters, dry conditions. As a result of that, the Brex have a number of species which are more often found with the, in the, the South European Garrigues and Maquis, and also in the steppe habitats which stretch east from Central Europe right to Mongolia. We have a whole host of species that I've seen, for example, in Mongolia, which in Britain can only be found in the Norfolk Brex. The Norfolk Brex are the single most important landscape in Britain for red data species, that threatened species. And we have a whole host of wonderful species found in the Brex. And if we go back to the map, have I got a point? Oh, my pointer doesn't work. But we're down in the southwest of the county, south of Swaffham, north of Bury St. Edmunds in the north of Suffolk, um, everything west of Attleborough. Um, is the Breckland landscape. And it's a whole range of different landscapes which have been grazed for centuries. But the Brecks being so poor, the soils being so light, so well drained, so low in nutrients, they've been a very, very difficult place to make a living for as long as humans have tried to make a living from them. So for some of the history of the Brecks, they've been used for mining flint. And of course, the Grimes Graves mines are there. But even up to the Victorian period, Swaffham was a major area for trading flints, for um, flintlock rifles, but also napped flint for the building of um, buildings such as this, or smaller churches. Um, the Brecks were very, very important for centuries for producing rabbits, um, because you could produce rabbits, which are a Mediterranean species, an Iberian species, in these very poor soils, on these very, very dry, sandy environments. They were very important for sheep grazing at certain points in their history. But you could only graze in one area for a short time. So as in parts of Europe, you had a, a transhumance, you would move the sheep 
across the landscape according to the time of the year. And that meant there were great droves. There were special tracks that went across the landscape through which the sheep were driven in rotation. And that led to very scuffed up short vegetation that was very important for some species. And then the other thing that you could do was shifting agriculture. And this is where the word breck itself comes from. You would break the ground to grow rye or oats, but you could only grow a very small field and you could only grow for one year in the same place because the soils were so poor. And what you ended up with as a result of all this was shifting sand. You would end up with big sand dunes that were blown by the big winds of this open landscape. You would end up with areas that were being turned over by the rabbits, by the shifting agriculture. And the brecks are perhaps most important for species that move on very quickly of open ground. So a number of exceptionally rare species of plant, like um, Breckland speedwell, like uh, spikes, uh, not spiked speedwell, that's one of the permanent grasslands, like um, finger fingered speedwell, early speedwell, um, and a number of other um, what we call arable weeds, but they're now extremely, extremely rare and confined to one or two spots in the brecks. But also a host of invertebrates that need that disturbed ground. Lots of species of moth that are particularly associated with those rare plants. Lots of species of bees and wasps that can only cope in those very, very sunny, open bits of grassland. So the brecks are extremely special, and as I say, one of the driving forces of them has been the bunny rabbit until the 1960s. In the early part of the 20th century, the brecks were destroyed. Effectively, we can say they were destroyed, and they were destroyed for a number of reasons. In the First World War, nationally, we ran out of timber. And so the Forestry Commission was created so that we would never run out of timber again. And what could you grow in these impossibly bleak landscapes with a continental climate? You could grow continental species of pine. And so that's when Corsican pines were planted in vast blocks across the Breckland landscape. Now, some areas were still left open, but even in the foundation years of Norfolk Wildlife Trust in the 1930s, there are letters in the archive about how worried our founders were about the fact that the whole of the Brex landscape was being converted to conifers. And indeed, we obtained our first reserve in 1932. Sidney Long was still just alive then. He died in 1939. Um, and at the time, he cleverly bought some cottages in Lakenheath. And they were commoners cottages, which had common rights over Lake and Heath Warren, which was one of the single most important areas of shifting sand in the Brex. And by virtue of owning these cottages, he owned the rights over the common, and it couldn't be destroyed until the Second World War at which point the war effort came in and obliterated the common rights. And Lakenheath is still to this day um, uh, an airbase, which obliterated one of the single most important areas for Ble Breckland shifting wildlife. But the rabbit was done for for a different reason, and that was, ironically, the invention of nitrate fertilizers. Because the brecks, remember, are sandy soil over the surface of the chalk, and they're absolutely rubbish for growing anything until you invent irrigation and nitrate fertilizers. And at that point, they become the very best place in the country for growing parsnips and carrots. And when you're growing parsnips and carrots, your worst enemy is the animal that has driven the landscape. And so what do you do? You introduce mixomatosis. So First World War timber shortages, creation of the Forestry Commission plantations, the introduction of irrigation and the nitrate fertilizers, introduction of myxomatosis, and we're now down from what was once this vast landscape of shifting sand and grassland down to tiny pockets here and there that are protected. The biggest areas, in fact, in military hands because, of course, the battle area is hugely important as a protected area because no one can go in and change the nature of the landscape. But where there was permanent grassland, you have exceptionally rare plants. This plant, spiked speedwell, the Norfolk form thereof is down to just one site, which is our Wheating Heath. Um, of course, it's the landscape of the stone curlew. Now, happily, stone curlews are now being protected by visionary farmers working with Natural England, with the RSPB, to protect stone curlews. And we're now up at 400 pairs nationally, something like that. But Norfolk is still a real stronghold. Here's one of the chicks that was hatched at our Wheating Heath Reserve 
a few years ago. And the Brexit were also ironically very important for water, because where you have water in the Brexit, it tends to be coming up from the bedrock of the chalk, and therefore it has existed since the retreat of the Deventian glaciation and is very important. And at our Thompson Common Reserve, where thanks to the generosity of the people of Norfolk and other donors, we've just purchased a large amount of new land that will be reverted to Brexit grassland. But there we have 400 pingos, and pingos are ice age pools. They occur from the retreat of the Devensian glaciation when springs came up from the chalk bedrock. And we had these brutally cold winters, and we had relatively warm summers. Now, during the brutally cold winters, the springs would freeze, and because ice is larger than water, the bulge of ice would push up the surface of the soil. Then, as the summer came along, you began to get warmer temperatures, the ice on the surface would begin to melt, and the soil that was lying over the top would slip off the lens of ice. And what that meant was that you ended up with the retreat of the glaciations with a round pond with a pile of rubble around the edge, which is referred to as a rampart. Now, these pools were, they would have existed commonly across the Brex landscape in the wetter areas, but really the capital of them today is Thompson Common, where there are 400. And these pools have existed spring-fed since the retreat of the Devensian glaciation. So they are critically important for two things. One, rare species. 58 red data species are associated with our pingos at Thompson Common. So that's 58 species that are listed as being threatened nationally. The other thing they're very, very important for is landscape history, because having existed for 12,000 years since the retreat of the Devensian glaciation, they have silts and, crucially, pollens in their bases which tell the history of the landscape for 12,000 years. Because pollen is virtually indestructible, and if you core down into the silt, you can tell what the landscape has looked like over several thousands of years. Now, one of the most important species associated with the pingos is this. This is the scarce emerald damselfly. In my childhood, my childhood dragonfly book said that this was probably extinct in Britain. This is because nobody had looked at Thompson Common, where they are positively common in the pingos, and it is the capital of the distribution of this beautiful species in the UK. And now increasingly this wonderful animal. Um, in the 1990s, the pool frog became extinct as a British species. This was a tragedy, and it was down to the fact that it was assumed that they were yet another Victorian introducee. The Victorians introduced marsh frogs, they introduced edible frogs, they introduced introduced midwife toads, they introduced various other species across the landscape, and it was thought that the pool frogs that were at Thompson Common were a Victorian introducee. And in the 1990s, as genetic techniques came along, uh, the UEA, in partnership with Natural England, tested the frogs that were left at Thompson and found that they were not just any old pool frog, they were northern pool frogs. They were the rare pool frogs that live in the tiger forest, the birch forest with lots of water where the cranes breed in the south edge of Scandinavia going into Fenniscandia. And it was found that these animals were a unique Ice Age relic. And by that time, sadly, we had already as good as lost them. So they disappeared in the late 1990s, but since the early 2000s, they've been being reintroduced, and we're happy to say they now occur at two sites in the Norfolk Brex, including a secluded, no public access area of um, Thompson Common. But last year, and indeed they were heard again this year, two males from the project have moved onto one of the most um, worn paths across the common. So you can again hear the wonderful clattering song of this gorgeous animal back in the very pingos where they were last seen in the 1990s. Now, the very final landscape is farmland. You can't talk about Norfolk's wildlife without talking about farmland. It is what we do with the landscape because we are blessed with some of the richest soils in the country, but it is also the reason that most of our wildlife has vanished during the course of the 20th century. Our grandparents grew up in a landscape without pesticides, as a result of which every field would have had a wonderful diversity of arable plants growing in it. Nowadays, they only occur at the very edges of the fields where they have been, and it's only the very common species that still persist where they, because they're able to cope with the massive change. We've ripped out the hedges on a vast 
vast scale. We have filled in 90% of our farmland ponds. We have contaminated much of our water. We plough every year on a massive scale, and this releases unbelievable amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, which drives climate change. We don't look after our soils in the way that we used to by putting organic matter back into them, which is what keeps them healthy and what keeps their biodiversity and also allows them to store carbon. As a result of this, we are losing our soils. Across the world, we're losing soil on um, a staggering scale. Nonetheless, our farmland remains important for some species. And so it's not fair to tar farmers across the board with um, the same brush because farmers Far, no farmer has ever said, I'm going to destroy that wildlife. You know what makes me happy? I'm going to wreck wildlife. Farmers have just been trapped in a system of food production in which they are enslaved to this mechanized mass productivity. Nonetheless, across parts of Norfolk, farmers are still protecting and shooting people are still protecting some of our scarce species. Norfolk's one of the most important counties in the country for the wonderful grey partridge. Likewise, the barn owl, which is fundamentally a farmland bird. It occurs right across farmland in Norfolk, and many farmers, of course, are very happy to see them. They leave strips at the edge of the fields for them to hunt on. They put up boxes for them to nest in. They're replenishing the hedges, which are important corridors for them. The brown hare, although the brown hare is a Roman introduction, it's nonetheless a species that we love and we care a great deal about and the brown hare Norfolk is one of its most important counties in the country. Now I'm going to leave you at the very end with one or two species whose fortunes are changing in surprising ways because if we have learned one thing in the face of the 20th and early 21st century is that wildlife has to adapt. This is a species called Cochlearia danica. It is a salt marsh plant it is a specific salt marsh plant that only lives in salt marsh until we started mass salting roads. And it's now one of a number of salt marsh plants along with them. Also, um, grassly doric, for example, which is a member of the, um, the uh, what used to be called the Kinopodiaceae, what's it called now? The Amaranthaceae, the amaranth family. Um, but this is a member of the cabbage family. And if you drive around the county in late April, early May, you will see this froth of pearly white flowers, very low to the ground, within six inches of the edges of the roads. And that's because this salt marsh plant has gone, woohoo, these humans have created salt marsh right across the network of roads around the county. And that is where we end with Danish scurvy grass. I am, of course, very happy to take questions if I haven't killed you by this point. Um, but I, I see we have someone bouncing up. Yes, do we have a formal way of taking questions at this point? Does anyone have a question? Has anyone lost the will to live? <laughs> Could I say before questions, just to give people a chance to reflect, but that was a truly encyclopedic presentation of the wildlife of Norfolk, quite extraordinary. Uh, you've told us a lot about various uh, uh, natural life, but I, I think that Nick Atchison is a force of nature in his own right. <laughs> a question immediately. I, oh, oh, there we are. I should say, by the way, while we're, before we get questions, that if anyone's interested in the work that we do at Norfolk Wildlife Trust, we have a small amount of information here which you can look at in a moment. And James, who works at the Trust, is here and you can talk to him again in a moment. But what was your question? Oh, hi. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, I just wondered about the urban environment. You mentioned the peregrines here and uh, I know the council have had this no mow may and they're trying to encourage you know, villages to grow and, and kind of use gardens as uh, uh, important habitat. So I just wonder what you study in the sort of urban environment. The urban environment, that's a brilliant question about the urban environment. The urban environment is phenomenally important for wildlife and this is because wildlife doesn't see borders and boundaries. The, the wildlife doesn't go, oh my goodness me, there's a town, I'm not going there. Obviously some species can't cope, but others will. A peregrine sees 
a Norman cathedral and goes, whoo, looks a lot like a cliff to me. I'll nest on that. And then the cathedral is good enough to allow a box to be placed on it. And so they move in. But we have right here in the city, which is the biggest urban environment in Norfolk, we have the River Wensum, which is the, the single most important corridor for wildlife through the county that connects northwest Norfolk with the Norfolk Broads. And so you've got a range of different habitats along it. Everywhere you are in the county, there is wildlife. And everywhere there is wildlife on the move, there is wildlife migrating. Norwich is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. The you could spend an entire lifetime in Norwich as a naturalist and still be seeing new things. In fact, one of the best naturalists in the county, a chap called James Emerson, who is one of the leading lights of the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society, he lives here in Norwich, and he, he, I couldn't begin to tell you the thousands of species of plants and invertebrates that he's seen right here in the city. So, so there is wildlife available for everybody. Even the most city-bound person has wildlife just screaming to be seen, to be noticed, and to be loved. Very much so. Just to make you run. Just want to make it's a good exercise. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, um, obviously, um, Norfolk Flint yes. is quite, quite famous mm. throughout the world. Uh, and I believe it's actually got an organic origin. Yes, yes. That's, Flint. Uh, that's uh, all, all I know about it. Yes. Flint was laid down also in the um, Cretaceous and amongst the chalk, so in the same ocean where the algae lived, the coccolithophores, there were an awful lot of animals like sponges. So a sponge, the wild sponge, is bristly in feel. That's why you use it on your skin, because it's full of silica, because it's full of glass, effectively. And with the death, again, over 30 million, 40 million years, with the death of these animals, the glass filtered down into cracks in the chalk where, under pressure, it became the flints, and so the flints are thought to be the, the spicules of silica from the bodies of sponges and sponge-like animals living in the late Cretaceous seas. Yeah, absolutely. As we say around here, that's been around a while, isn't it? Any more? Could I ask a question about um, the proposed new agricultural policies post-Brexit post that are coming forward and whether you see any cause for hope from that direction? That's, a, that's an excellent question. If you are a naturalist, a conservationist, and an environmentalist, hope is a difficult thing in the world we live in. One tries to be positive and one tries to be, because without trying to fight for whatever we have, there is no hope. I would come at that question from a number of different ways. There, there is clearly informed and well-meaning ambition to do good. The scope of what is proposed at the moment is trivial compared to the scale of the problem in environmental terms. I mean, just looking at carbon and methane and our changing climate, um, we need to act on a phenomenal scale. And, and it's not just, the environment and biodiversity can't be separated. They are, they are one and the same. They are yin and yang. They, the environment is what we exist in, but it is created by the biosphere and the biosphere exists within it. And so we need, as a species, if we ourselves are to survive, we need not just to pick around at the edges in terms of, of farming policy and so on. We need to hurl the kitchen sink and everything else we've got at the problems facing us because now this is, you've got me very, very doom laden here, but, but the experience of the last 18 months with COVID is, is nothing but a, but a trivial frippery compared to what we can expect from climate change and the collapse of the biosphere, sadly. So, so yes, the right noises are being made, but we as society need to make them, we need to demand it as the single most important thing, the biggest challenge humanity's ever faced and the single most important political thing in our lifetimes. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> This is rather a mundane question, but you talked a lot about water. 
And I just wonder if the terrible water that comes out of our tap in Norwich is nature's fault or the fault of Anglo water? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really know how to answer. Is it terrible in that it's terribly hard? I, I, yes, okay. That's, I, I, I can't recognise exactly where your accent's from, but you don't want to live in Norfolk if you don't like hard water. I, it's, just what we, um, it's just what we have here because it comes out of chalk. And therefore, it's absolutely full of, um, of, of alkaline um, chemicals. And therefore, it, it, but we have hard water in Norfolk, I'm afraid. So, so it's, I wouldn't say fault. It's nature's blessing. Yeah, but if you want soft socks, don't live in Norfolk. <laughs> yeah. we, 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 we like crispy clothes in Norfolk. <laughs> yeah, have you come from elsewhere? Yes, well, d d don't disparage our water. <laughs> um, I, I'd, I've never known any other water, and I, I love the taste. <laughs> it tastes like bleach. <laughs> well, th that's the chlorine, put it. I'm not, d other water companies are available, but the smell and taste of chlorine is, is not, that's chlorine that's been put to, to sterilize the water, not the, 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 let's not blame the late Cretaceous coccolithophores for that one. <laughs> right. If there aren't any other questions, then um, before we uh, pay our final tribute to, to what Nick has shared with us, could I just say, uh, it's usual, my usual custom at this point to say, you know, please do come along next week. Um, and next week, our speaker is, uh, you know, uh, true celebrity, Professor Ben Garrard from the UEA, but I have to say, if you don't have a ticket, don't bother to come, because we are absolutely sold out. Um, so I, I hope that uh, if, if you wanted to hear Ben Garrard, then, then you have a ticket, otherwise you'll have to, to catch up on the, uh, the online recording. But um, thank you very much for being here this evening, and I think that our presence here has been amply rewarded by what Nick has shared with us. So thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. If, if you are interested in what we do at Norfolk Wildlife Trust, James and I are more than delighted to speak to you. Thank you. I just say, if you haven't been before, the, the exits this evening are either through uh, the Monk store, which is just, just behind you on the south side there, or um, if you follow the, the aisle, the north aisle here, it will take you out into the cloister and out to the exit. Thank you.